Before I start to tell you about Brinkwood, the Blood of Tyrants, I would like to arrange a short disclaimer. See, my name is in the front of this book. It's not just because I backed this game on Kickstarter and at the highest level I could afford, which I did because I believed in the project, and it's not just because the developer is a friend and I really wanted this project to succeed because he's my friend. It's also that the original inspiration for this game came from, I kid you not, the name, the subtitle, and a one-sentence pitch for a Dungeons & Dragons game that never happened. I designed the logo and the name Brinkwood, the Blood of Tyrants, for a weekend D&D game with some friends, which I pitched as Robin Hood vs. the Vampires. We didn't do that, so I showed the logo off on Twitter, and Eric, the creator of this game, said, Yo, that slaps. Uh, may I? And with my blessing, he went on to develop uh, an entire game system and law and the product that now sits before me on my desk and that I'm now trying to tell you about. Now, I'm not one of those people who believes in the idea of like the unbiased review and the notion that somehow I should be capable of transcending any kind of boundaries regarding that. I think that entire concept is farcical. I think that the notion that a review should be itself unbiased is nonsense and instead represents the vision of the world as having a sort of universal fairness and correct opinions about games that we're all just trying to navigate towards, which is a load of nonsense. It's absolutely pish. But I do think that you learn a lot about people by what they respond to and what they relate to. And in this case, because I'm the person who pitched the original idea that led to this game being made, it's pretty likely that I already think this idea is extremely cool. But, you know, that context might be helpful for you. After all, what if it turns out that I hate Brinkwood, and I'm deeply disappointed with it, and I decided the best way to let my friend know that I was upset was a 15-minute YouTube video with sliding graphics? That seems like a real dickhead thing to do, now I say it, but, you know... There have been pettier things on YouTube. Anyway, that's just a disclaimer. I want you to know ahead of time that I am extremely biased to say that pretty much everything in this book whips. So instead of trying to convince you that that's an empirical truth, I instead want to tell you how I feel about Brinkwood, why I think it's cool, and why I think you might like Brinkwood if you decide to check it out. Part 1. The Pitch That Burns. Mask up. Spill blood. Drink the rich. Brinkwood, The Blood of Tyrants, is a forged-in-the-dark tabletop role-playing game about building a rebellion that will overthrow the blood-soaked vampires that oppress and dominate your world. You are a brigand, a commoner radicalized by tragedy, who has decided to forsake their old life and flee into the woods to plot a rebellion. The Bloody Isles are your home, a kingdom on the brink of open revolt against the vampiric nobles and factory lords who rule over it. And all it will take is a single spark, your spark. Whether you're robbing from the rich and giving to the poor, or assassinating vampires and drinking their blood, every move you make will take you closer to your goal, liberating your home from the vampiric scourge of blood rent and exploitation. That is your box copy. Now, there are some phrases in there. That if you already know what they mean, you are probably good to go. It is a forged in the dark game about playing brigands hunting aristocratic vampires in an attempt to overthrow a corrupt government. Now, there is a category of the audience at the moment who say something to the effect of, I know that rules, that sounds like it rules, does it deliver on whether or not it rules? And we will get there. But for those of you who are catching up, what's a forged in the dark game? Forge in the Dark is a system first established in a game called Blades in the Dark. It is a very fluid, very easy system to understand and handle and to create in, and it kind of became something of an indie darling very quickly. Forge in the Dark is the open source rule set that the Blades in the Dark developers Evil Hat made sure people could use so that they could make their own variants on the basic rule system of Blades in the Dark. The big thing you'll want to know about this 
is the dice rolling. Because that's one of these things that like mechanical systems stick in the brain. The way that character sheets are laid out and all sorts of cool rules in the Forge of the Dark system aren't going to click for you quite as well as just knowing the dice resolution. See, rather than using specialized dice, Forge of the Dark games use a dice pool system where you use D6s. To explain this in a simple way, imagine that you're trying to do a thing and you're not very good at it, but you can still do it, so you probably get one dice. Someone who is better than you can get two dice, maybe someone even better, three dice. And that creates a very simple curve of how to represent being better at things. But it's not a simple matter of rolling all the dice and then adding them up and doing some math or checking it against a difficulty curve. No. The way Forged in the Dark works is if you roll your dice and any of them come up a six, that's it. Success. Easy. You have done it. Easy game, easy life. There is no problem at all with what you're trying to do. And you might think, doesn't that make lots of things very easy to execute on? After all, your odds of rolling a six on a d6 is one in six. And for anyone seasoned with the game, you might be immediately thinking about the times when you had a lot of dice to roll. And not only did you not get a six, you didn't get close. And that's where the game starts to give you wrinkles. In a Forge of the Dark game, sixes are successes. And if you get a success, you succeed. Easy. But if the highest number you roll is a four or a five, instead of a success, you get a success but. You get a success with a complication. You did succeed. You got the thing you were trying to do done. But now there's an added problem. Now something else is happening. Now you, you got hurt in the process, or maybe you've gathered some attention. If the highest number you rolled is a three or lower, then not only did you not succeed, but something went wrong. And this is the core tension of the game. On average, you succeed at things. But when you succeed at things, most of the time when you succeed, that success complicates the story. And even if you are rolling giant mitfuls of dice, you can still somehow not get the success you need and have to make do with the success but. This very simple system is used throughout the game for almost every single type of rolling you can do. It means that rolls are very consistent, and it also means that you can be good at something, but never so good it's always guaranteed. And even if you're bad at something, you might as well give it a go, because your odds of pulling off that lucky success isn't 1 in 20, like in other games, but is instead 1 in 6. This gives the whole game a very freewheeling, give it a shot, have a go kind of feeling, which was really good for Blades in the Dark's base game of being a bunch of heist-doing criminals. There was a certain Larry Daring Do, and that comes through in a lot of that game's systems, where there are things like stress and police attention that you need to make sure you're dealing with. Blades in the Dark absolutely smashed it. It's a great game. I definitely recommend, if you like the idea of playing that kind of criminal gang, definitely check it out. If, however, you haven't played Blades in the Dark, and this system interests you, I would recommend you start with Brinkwood. The most obvious comparison that can be made with any role-playing game is to Dungeons & Dragons, and this is a contentious issue, especially amongst indie TTRPGs, because a lot of them are real, real mad that people like D&D. Not, as far as I know, Eric. Um, we could talk all sorts of things that are bad about D&D, including and especially their treatment of Orion Black and other marginalized creators in a very purely corporate way. But that's not the same thing as saying everyone who loves D&D is doing something wrong. Instead, what I'd like to do is talk about the kinds of games that Brinkwood lets you play and then compare that to how they would work in Dungeons & Dragons. Brinkwood is a game with a distinct narrative momentum. That is to say, at the start of the game, you have a path ahead of you that you're pretty sure is going to culminate in a confrontation and a denouement. There is, in an almost movie-like sense, a grand ending awaiting you in Brinkwood. 
And the structure of the game's story and the way all the systems are built are there to push you towards that and to accelerate it as it gets closer. Dungeons & Dragons definitely can be used to tell a anti-capitalist story of fighting vampires. That campaign of D&D, however, is very different to a Brinkwood campaign. In D&D, typically speaking, the game design is built around endurance. You have multiple numbers of tactical encounters, a number of resources that are expended per day, and you're expected to preemptively plan for things in a way that keeps resources in a constant flow. You need your healing potions and you need your supplies, and when your supplies are used up because of an encounter, you have to go get more supplies and you're expected to be on a very material, very permanent kind of onward progression. Dungeons & Dragons is, simply put, a slower-feeling game. You will have explorations into, say, a mansion or an estate or a crypt, which will maybe necessitate two or three combats, and they will themselves be the thing that wears you out, and then you have to go home and spend some time recovering or investigating the next arc. In Brinkwood you can arrive at a session with no planning at all and wind up going to a mansion, having a party there, fighting someone over the dinner table and escaping out of a window, all without time spent on that planning and focus element and without that same vision of endurance. Dungeons & Dragons wants to give you a bunch of resources up front and watch you carefully, sparingly dole them out over the course of a level whereupon you get a new bucket. Brinkwood wants to push you downhill and watch as you start to roll. Brinkwood also just doesn't need you to answer a lot of questions that are normally there in a Dungeons & Dragons style game. Why are things like this? Where did these things come from? How does this integrate into the ecology of the world? Those aren't as important because your characters aren't meant to be these global experts who have access to vast restores of knowledge. Instead, Brinkwood is about you being a person who lives in this world. You don't need to know why the castle has buttresses like that, you just know it's the castle with buttresses, because how it became shaped that way is not as immediately necessary to know. This might tweak off certain extremely nerdy people, Uh, Because the premise of Brinkwood is not about a realistic medievalism, but is instead about using the trappings of that medieval world to express something that we can recognize in our now and day to day. It's what the game itself refers to as castle punk. Part 2. Communicating Values. Games are philosophy engines. The values and ideas of the people involved in the creation of the game are expressed in the way they create it. And that, in turn, is a element that you will engage with when you play the game. This is all stuff that I'm already writing thousands of words about on a daily basis, and part of why I do paperwork for a university. You don't need to try and argue on this one. Just accept the idea that people who make things impart elements of themselves on the things they make. Rather than attempt to monastically remove all trace of yourself from work you've created, then, is to focus on what you do impart on a work and look at what that says about the work. See if the things that you are showing of yourself make you proud. This game, where you can build a stake railgun to puncture the face of a vampire lord protected by metal robot spiders, is very good at communicating its values. This is where a certain category of person goes, oh, it's all political. And like, yes, congratulations. Thank you for catching up. Yes, it it is all political. Literally everything is political. Uh, Politics is the emergence of how we interface with power in a human relationship system. It is literally all political. Thanks. But if what you really mean is, I don't want to have to learn anarchism to get along with this game, don't worry, you don't you may have to get along with the idea of stabbing vampires in the face. But if you can't jam with that, maybe you just weren't going to jam with this game in the first place. Look, Brinkwood is a game that wears its politics very clearly on its sleeve, but I want to talk about three layers of that. The first is the very obvious one, that this game has made vampirism into late-stage capitalism. Because... Vampirism has always been a very useful metaphor 
for abusive power. It used to be used to represent the idea of what if there was an aristocrat, but that aristocrat was a bad one and not just a good one. And and what if the badness of that aristocrat was so bad that it could overwhelm the queen's aristocratness? It really is. What if a foreign invading noble could walk our streets as if he was in charge? <sighs> In Brinkwood, the vampire lords are very clearly used to represent very real present things that we already have to deal with, like, for example, landlords and billionaires. This isn't subtle, but also it's not trying to be subtle. It's not trying to convince you of this stuff. You may think that rent systems as they currently exist are good, but if rent was literally taking a section of your blood and your children's blood, you'd probably think that was bad, right? So even if you think rent is okay, you can at least look at this game and go, ah, but there is a too far. If you are, however, of the opinion that it would be completely fine for your landlord to want to drain some of the blood out of your children, what the fuck? These political values inform the game's world-setting law and what it seems as acceptable targets. The game is itself okay with ideas like toppling bad kings. It's not like a lot of other fantasy RPGs where, yeah, there's a bad king, but what can you do about him? He's a bad king. King's right there in the name. And if you kill him, you'll just get another bad king, right? They've got an endless supply of them, which is a hopeless position, but also one that works against the kind of narrative momentum that Brinkwood wants you to have. Lots of tabletop RPG settings are presented as a sort of enlightened stasis. You don't know what's going to change the Mornland, because nothing will probably change the Mornland. You might choose to do that in your game, but broadly speaking, the rulebooks are always going to treat the Mornland as if it's like pretty much always going to be like the Mornland. What this means is that those games say everything is more or less going to hold, whereas Brinkwood is saying this cannot abide. That is a political value that changes the type of game you play and, in my opinion, gives you a really interesting kind of game format. Because this is no longer about how do we find the best way to exist in this static world, but instead, what are we going to do to change the world and how can we make sure the way we change it changes it for the better? That's not all, though. The game also has a strong vision of what I would consider to be player-focused values. There is a language of role-playing games that even jokingly refers to players as problems for the story runner to reckon with. That they are there to be punished, or that they are there to be fooled. The Brinkwood rulebook refers to players for a start, inclusively. It uses the term playgroup to make sure that you know that the storyteller is included with the players. And that kind of language just automatically is a different perspective to a, a lot of these other more contested and punitive game designs. There is also just a very dedicated sense of care about all the word choices. There is a deliberate attempt to make the word choice in this game respectful of people, even as it's discussing gory violence, even as it's discussing marginalization and tragedy. This game book is also trying to make sure that the player who is reading it is being guided along well. There is a clear thought put to the flow of the book itself. There's sections of the book which, for example, will say, hey, if you know these rules, you probably can skip most of this section, but here are some key details you want to keep an eye out for. There is a respect of players that I do not often see in books of this ilk. It is very common for books in the TTRPG space to be either unclear in a way that assumes players will come up with their own explanation, or tedious in a way that assumes players are not smart enough to follow along being spoken to like adults. There is very technical dry language, which incidentally can probably be tied back to Dungeons & Dragons, that TTRPGs use incessantly, and the Brinkwood book instead writes like the author is talking to you like a person and pretty much like an adult. So the rules are built and written so that you 
can engage with them. There is not a gatekeeper in this book. It even talks about the ways that you might accidentally slip into different rule sets and how that's okay. There is a third thing in this space of communicating values, which is kind of the secret magic of Brinkwood. Brinkwood is a game system written with theatrical ritual to it. The tabletop RPG, while it has exploded in public interest, is still something where there is an element of cringe. People can watch professionals play these games with a high level of theatrical ability and then feel bad that their own game experiences don't match up to that. People can struggle with just getting into the fictional space themselves, especially early on and especially first-timers. There are a category of people who never were happy with the fact that people stopped playing Let's Pretend in the playground and just flew into role-playing game spaces immediately because, hey, look, there's rules now. It's it's a game. No, it's, it's tactical. Uh, you know, please don't make fun of me. But for some people who are interested in the space but don't necessarily have it in them to get into them spaces and into that mindset easily, Brinkwood has, in the character creation and team creation process, a communal element of ritual. There is a process where all the players are going to share in an experience of creating something together and discussing it together, which, if done respectfully, and if there's new players, especially cautious players, then you should show some bloody respect, and all of that comes together to make, as a rule-based experience, a creative act where everyone is sharing in the emotional load. It is literally the purpose of ritual. It is literally the aim of the sacred, that we are now included in this moment because we did the right things and we said the right words, and there is something special to that. This idea in this rulebook is used at the start to ease players in. I have said that one of the worst things indie tabletop RPGs do is have bad on-ramps, bad ways to get players into their space and into the play. This is an amazing one. And the thing is, if you're sharing pieces of paper around a table, and someone at the table is getting into it and writing up ideas for their fay as you all share in it, and you find yourself recoiling from that, if you feel the cringe, you don't have to say anything, because you get handed a piece of paper and you can write it down. You can write down your idea, even if it's not a particularly good one, even if it's not one you're excited by, and pass it on. You are part of the ritual, but you do not have to put out yourself to do it. That's really amazingly good work, and it's something that other games could benefit from. But because Brinkwood is built around its specific ideas and its specific settings and the importance of the Fae in the setting, that's a way to get you into Brinkwood. It's not going to work for everything else. For everything else, they're going to need to find their own way to do these rituals. Just look at Brinkwood for a great example. Part 3. Miscellaneous Praise. Yeah, there's just a bunch of stuff in this game book that I wanted to point out that isn't necessarily, like, you know, worth a full exploratory entry. Um, the game language is beautiful. There's a particular character to the way that language is used in this. There's a certain oldie worldy utility to it, but also not binding itself to obscure words for the sake of them. You get to see some words that are used with a certain obscurity to them that nonetheless feel very natural and right. I particularly like the word cog scamper because that's a perfect term for the kind of horrifying thing that it is. It's, it's child laborers who work in large industrial machines and we use that kind of neutralizing language that makes it sound fun and charming. Uh, the book is, is fluidly written. It is practically frictionless to get through this. One of my biggest challenges with talking about this book in the first place is because it's such an easy read, I know that there are details I have missed in previous sections that I could probably have provided you chapter and verse on, except I know it's in there, I know I read it, but finding it is actually kind of challenging. There's also the way that the game shifts the focus on a devil's bargain away from the devil, a hypothetical abstract that sort of represents just bad luck in general, to the masks, which means that in Brinkwood, you have, rather than this external force, you have a mask that's physically with you, and that's the thing you're making these deals with. 
and it can be traded around, it can be handed off. It is a really interesting transformation of the setting. Similarly, in Brinkwood, the SCAR system works very differently to the way it does in Blades in the Dark. Blades in the Dark, you are basically being dropped into a pachinko machine, and at some point you will be too battered to progress any further and you just hang there. Whereas in Brinkwood, you are always accelerating towards an end to the story rather than giving up on the story. I also like that when the game lists reasons to do things, the pacts you can commit yourself to, vengeance, justice, solidarity, freedom, wisdom, industry, and beauty are the list of traits. That's excellent to me, especially because it doesn't treat the task of changing the world for the better as if it is just justice, as if it is just freedom. There are elements in this that can be seen to be in contention with one another even, where vengeance may demand one thing, but justice demands a cessation of that vengeance, where solidarity and freedom may seem to be at odds with each other, and also that beauty is here. Beauty is here to remind us that it is not just a task of changing the world through violence and the correct application of same, but also the making of things. The crafting and sharing of beauty and art is itself part of this grand project of changing the world. A long time ago now, in 2016, I read the phrase, you need spoons to make shivs. And even if you don't know what spoon theory is, I think that that serves as a good practical example of how to think about escapism and fun in these times. Part 4. Conclusion. I concepted something like Brinkwood a long time ago, and Eric and numerous other contributors took that idea to a place that I never would have imagined and created something better than I could have dreamt. This book is lovely. The game it presents is engaging. It's funny. It's well-written. It's dark fantasy that doesn't make me embarrassed to talk about it. And... The whole thing, as with great works before it, is about preparing you to embrace change in a world that you have to make happen yourself, even if it involves acts of violence and sabotage against vast evil systems that have been around since before you were born and exist entirely to feed on you until it can't make use of you and then process your death. And also, in the game, doing that. 